Hello everyone and welcome to Scream Stream where every week I scour the web to separate the best from the worst of streaming horror so you don't have to. I'm James Gass. If you're new to the show, what I do is I pick a horror film from one of the various streaming services and give it a spoiler free review and let you know if it's worth watching. There's a lot of horror films out there so my goal is to make sure you're spending your time watching the good ones. If you'd like to keep up with me outside of the podcast, you can do so at ScreamPod.com, where you can find links to all of my social profiles, subscribe to the podcast via your favorite podcatcher, and get the show notes for each episode. You can also drop me a line with comments and suggestions to ScreamStreamCast at gmail.com, or you can also fill out the contact form there. ScreamStream is listener supported and you can support the podcast through Patreon over at patreon.com slash ScreamStream. Donate as little or as much as you like, but if you give at least a dollar or more, you'll get the original ScreamStream podcast that ran from 2014 to 2015 a week early before they go public on Patreon. You'll also get the exclusive patron-only podcast, When the Screaming Stops, and this is more like a behind-the-scenes kind of uh, podcast. I'll also talk about films that I've been watching during the week, um, films that I have my eye on, other things like that. Uh, Just consider it to be extra content that you'll get for being a patron. You'll receive a private RSS feed for that podcast so that you can add that to any podcast app. And then the easiest way for you to support the Scream Stream is to share the podcast with the horror fanatics in your life and help grow the Scream Stream community. Share it on Twitter, on Facebook, Reddit, or wherever you do most of your social media. Just share out the screampod.com slash podcast link in as many places as you can. So let's get into this week's show. And this week's episode is all about horror for younger audiences. And this uh, top or the topic for this episode came up uh, when I was on Twitter last week. Uh, Actually, I was on Facebook and I saw somebody get upset about the new uh, Meg film uh, from Eli Roth getting a PG-13 rating and they got all upset about it. And so I, I went on Twitter and I was like, you know, Just because a film gets a PG-13 rating doesn't mean it's automatically bad. And somebody else chimed in saying that, well, Happy Death Day got a PG-13 rating and it was terrible. And I was like, you know, that's not really a good film to use for your counter argument, but okay, whatever. Um, And then that person came back and said, yeah, I'm just being facetious. There just isn't enough good horror for younger viewers and I thought, well, yeah, there is. There's, there's not enough room on Twitter for me to list off a bunch of movies. So I thought, you know, hey, I'm going to make a whole podcast episode dedicated just to horror for younger audiences. Um, and that person thought I should just call the episode Gremlins. So <laughs> that's what we're going to do today. So I took to Twitter and Reddit. Uh, asking for some horror movie and uh, TV suggestions, and I got a lot of great comments. And I'm going to list uh, most of those, all the really good ones, uh, after my review of this week's movie. Uh, and I'll also let you know if those are available for streaming and where you can stream those from. Now, sticking with the theme for the episode, this week's film is Paranorman. And this film is from 2012. It's an animated film, and it currently has a 7.0 on IMDb. It was directed by Chris Butler and Sam Fell, and it was written by Chris Butler. It stars Cody Smith-McPhee, Anna Kendrick, Christopher mintz Place, uh, Casey Affleck, Leslie Mann, Jeff Garland, Alex Born- Borstein, uh, who is also on Family Guy, and John Goodman. So a lot of big names in uh, in this movie. And for a brief plot synopsis, a misunderstood boy takes on ghosts, zombies, and grown-ups to save his town from a centuries-old curse. So this film, I actually watched this film um, several years ago. I remember liking it a lot. And I think the reason why I like this film so much, not only because it, it still exists within the genre of horror, but I kind of related to the character of Norman 
he is sort of like this weird kid other than the whole talking to ghosts. Cause he does talk to ghosts and that's not really a spoiler. That's mentioned right up front. I didn't talk to ghosts, but he is like a huge horror fan. He's a little kid, uh, has tons of like horror posters around his room, draws monsters. I drew monsters. I think, you know, at that age, he and I both sort of shared this passion for horror films. And I think that's why I related to him so much. And also, um, because he was a little weirder than the other kids, he got picked on a lot, which I did. I, I got picked on quite a bit when I was uh, younger, uh, all the way up through high school. So uh, I really connected with Norman like right off the bat. Uh, so the film, you can probably already tell that it takes on a couple of different issues regarding uh, bullying. Uh, there are some family issues with his parents, and I don't want to give a whole lot away, uh, so I'm kind of careful of what I say. But but I really did enjoy the film. The animation uh, in this one is really, really good. Parts of it, like it's it's CGI, but it's a really good-looking CGI. And it's not the kind of CGI that tries to do things realistically. They don't try to make the people look realistic. It's still very cartoony. All the characters are very cartoony. Uh, they just have sort of a, a realistic textures, uh, skin tones, things like that. And I really appreciated that. So all the artwork in the movie is great. As far as the acting, uh, acting is fantastic. And, I, you know, I don't recognize the person who played uh, Norman, Cody Smith McPhee. I see that he was in he was in uh, Let Me In, which I, I didn't actually watch. And he was in The Road and... I went to other films that I just haven't really seen. Yeah, I guess he was fairly younger in this movie, and he did a great job, actually, to be honest with you. He and Tucker Albrizzi, who played Neil, uh, were absolutely fantastic. Sometimes I, I think that when you watch an animated film, uh, people who do the voicing, is they're a little robotic, and... I. You know, sometimes they they act with each other in the same room, and sometimes they listen to recordings of each other and then react that way. Everything in this felt natural. It felt like they were actually there having these conversations. I really did appreciate that. Uh, Anna Kendrick did a great job. Uh, Casey Affleck was Mitch and didn't really sound like Casey Affleck. He did a great job. As far as the story goes, I thought the story was extremely entertaining and it really keeps you involved the whole way through. I think the pacing uh, is what really helped out a lot. It's very like, I want to say it's a fast paced film, but it, it keeps a nice pace all the way through. It doesn't ever just slow down to a complete halt. Uh, I really cared about the characters as well. Even the, the bullies, I don't want to say a whole lot about that, but I mean, I cared about everybody in the picture. And that's very rare for you to actually, for all the characters, you kind of, you, you root for all of them because there are some surprising twists involving, involving all these people. Um, it was genuinely funny. It wasn't forced humor. Sometimes with, when you mix horror and comedy, sometimes the comedy feels a little forced, uh, or just over the top goofy. Uh, the comedy in this was genuine. I thought it was extreme. It, it was, it was naturally funny. And some of it was, I mean, it's a cartoon. So some of it was silly, but it was appropriate though. And, and I, I laughed a lot. Um, I laughed with the film, not really like at the film. Like I wasn't trying to like make fun of the film at all. If that makes sense, I don't know if that makes sense. It was a funny film, <laughs> and the, the humor was appropriate. And the humor was actually well-timed. I thought everything was, like, right on beat. And I thought the cinematography was great. All the shots were excellent. And when you're doing a film like this, I think uh, because it is animated and because everything is CG, you have a lot more flexibility as to what kind of shots you can have. Uh, there were some really cool overhead shots, some really cool close-ups and the way the camera moved around certain characters. Uh, I thought everything was just really, it just really looked cool. The cinematography was excellent. 
Um, art direction was was great. I just I think this is like one of my favorite animated films. I don't really have a whole lot of anim- animated films that I like just really really like, uh, but I think this is one of them. Uh, and be and plus because it does exist within the genre of horror, it gets you know extra points for that. Uh, 7.0 I think is a little low. I think this should at least be an eight. Uh, that's what I would give it. So just all around a great film. It is rated PG for scary action images, thematic elements, uh, some rude humor, and a little bit of language. Uh, so if you have kids and you're tr- and you want to introduce them into horror, this is a great place to start. Uh, another film I would recommend would be. Uh, Monster House, which is another animated film. Not as good as this one, but it is still pretty good. So these are like really gateway horror for for really young audiences. I'd say, you know, maybe 10 and younger and even older, I guess, if, if you have kids that are a little older and not yet into horror. This is a really good gateway film for them. So let's move on to some other uh, TV and horror films for younger audiences when i was a little kid i don't really think we had a lot of horror for for young people they we had you know the the animated specials like uh charlie brown's uh great pumpkin and uh garfield in disguise which i do actually still have the the book for that Uh, we had that but other than that there wasn't a whole lot until i got older when we finally got Goosebumps and Are You Afraid of the Dark. So I kind of want to go through and give you some ideas. If you have kids or younger kids and you want to get them into horror, because let's face it, if you're listening to this show, you're a horror fanatic, and you want to get your kids into it um, without throwing them into something like I was thrown into. I didn't really throw threw myself into it with um, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street and uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. If you, you want to start them off, you know, with some some lighthearted horror stuff, hopefully I can provide that for you. Uh, now, we do have the obvious things that, such as uh, the Scooby-Doo show from the 70s, which I love. I absolutely love Scooby-Doo. And if you if you do love Scooby-Doo and you your kids love Scooby-Doo, one of my favorite Scooby-Doo movies was uh, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. I have to warn you, though. The the monsters in that cartoon are actually real. Uh, they weren't people in costumes. And I saw one review on Amazon. Somebody was upset because uh, they kept telling their kids that monsters weren't real. Here, watch this. And it turns out that the monsters on Zombie Island weren't real. And so he got all upset because his kid was upset. And I, th- I, I think if you're worried about that, read the synopsis before you let your kid watch it. But anyway, I digress. Uh, that was actually a really good one where... The monsters were real, but it still wasn't scary, you know what I mean? Uh, it was still a fun watch uh, and still in that realm of horror. I, I appreciated that because for years, Scooby-Doo was always about people are the monsters. And then we now we have real monsters and what are we going to do about it? And some other uh, TV shows for younger viewers, Are You Afraid of the Dark? This was one of my favorites when I was, I guess I was like right around middle school, going into high school, I think. And this was a show that came on Saturday Saturday nights on Nickelodeon. They called it Snick, Saturday Night Nick. And this is actually one of my absolute favorite horror TV shows. And unfortunately, they used to have this streaming on Prime. They took it off. Uh, But you can buy the, the whole series on Prime. It's a little expensive, though, but it's digital. You can buy it digitally on Amazon Prime, or you can find the DVDs out there. But this is a really good show for maybe your older kids, maybe around 12 and up. Some really good stories, really good acting. There are actually some famous people in this show. Uh, Bobcat Goldthwait was in, in an episode. Melissa Joan Hart. Yeah, Ryan Gosling was in an episode. Tyler Labine, uh, who you would probably recognize from uh, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. So there were actually a few big names who got their start uh, on this show. So again, that is Are You Afraid of the Dark? 
Uh, I will put a link to that in Amazon, and you can pick that up there. Uh, I think, you know, this show also still stands the test of time. I think it, it doesn't seem dated at all. I went back and watched a bunch of old episodes. Other than the type of film they used, uh, it, it doesn't look dated, well, other than the clothes. But I, I think the stories still hold up, and they're still pretty spooky. Some of them actually gave me a lot of chill bumps when I was watching these um, when I was younger. Uh, and then next on my list would be R.L. Stein's Goosebumps, and you can stream these on Netflix. Uh, unfortunately, some of the episodes are missing from the seasons. Uh, you can go and, and look on IMDb to see which ones are missing. But th this was, uh, I think this show was a little, I think it was more for, for younger audiences than Are You Afraid of the Dark? Um, but the episodes, I think, were still really good. I still enjoyed them a lot. Some of the more famous episodes would be like uh, the Matt was the mask, the haunted mask, um, and the ventriloquist dummy. Uh, I forgot what his name was. Um, those are some really good episodes. They're there on Netflix, so I would recommend go and check out R.L. Stein's if you have younger kids, like maybe you know twelve and under. That's probably like perfect for them. And then the haunting hour, I think, is more for the teenage audience. Um, some of the stories are a little more uh, teen-oriented uh, for that older group. Still very spooky stories, and this is also on Netflix, and I would highly recommend that you check those out um, with your kids. You know, even as adults, you might still enjoy these shows, because uh, I know I do. I might be the only one. Hopefully not. I don't know. And then also The Nightmare Room. This one is also geared more for uh, teenagers. Unfortunately, it's not streaming anywhere, but you can still buy the DVDs and the VHS tapes on um, on Amazon. But yeah, it is not streaming as far as I could find. Now, if you could find it streaming somewhere, let me know on Twitter at James Gas, and I'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes. As, as a matter of fact, you can find the show notes for this episode over at screenpod.com slash podcast slash seven, the number seven. Um, Stranger Things, probably again, more for the teenagers, uh, just because of language. And there are some scary moments in that show, maybe for not for, you know, anyone under 14. Uh, now, if you're worried about your kids hearing language, strong language, let's face it, they're probably saying more than you really think they are. <laughs> let's just be honest here. Uh, so... That's, I mean, that's just, I wouldn't really worry about language too much, but it is a great show for, for teenagers, I think. There's no, like, nudity or anything in there. There's no, like, real, there's no F-bombs, nothing like that. But that's a really great show to watch with your with your kids, with maybe even your older kids. And again, that is a uh, Netflix show. And then let's move on to some of the movies that, that people recommended. And they I got some really good recommendations. Um, the Witches, which is streaming on Amazon Prime. This was based off of the book of the same name. Uh, I actually haven't uh, seen the movie, but I did read the book, and the book was great. Again, it's not really scary, and it's more for a younger audience, but it, it's still a fun watch. Uh, Poltergeist. Now, Poltergeist, is that's a tough one, because when I was a kid, the scene with the stake... The, actually, that scene and the one that follows scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. Uh, now, this film only has a PG. It's a PG rated film, which, you know, by today's standards, and I'm talking about the original Polter Poltergeist, by the way, from 1982. By today's standards, I think this film would actually get like a PG-13. Uh, I don't think it'd be an R rating, but definitely a PG-13 uh, this is probably not for any kid under 14 years old. You know, I say all this stuff, but here I was. I was, you know, in first grade watching Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, <laughs> so take my recommendations with a grain of salt. But maybe 14 and older, because there are some really scary moments in this movie. And I know you've you've probably already seen it. But yeah, it is another good one. It's it's one of those gateway horror films where it's not real bad, but it's it's pretty scary in some moments. It's like just enough to to get their blood going. 
the gate, the gate was actually a really good movie. And my sister took me to see this when I was a kid. Uh, I was living in Nebraska at the time. Uh, and this came out in 1987. And while we were watching the movie, the power went out in the theater and everything went black. And that was probably the reason why it scared me the most. Uh, but this film is rated PG-13, uh, mostly for language, I think. Now, there is some scary stuff in here. A lot of it is stop motion. So it, by today's visual standards, it looks a little cheesy sometimes. Some of it's a little laughable. But I think it's a really good story and another really g good gateway horror film. Uh, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, here's a brief pl plot synopsis. Kids left home alone accidentally unleashes a horde of malevolent pint-sized demons from a mysterious hole in their suburban backyard. Uh, this is the movie where lightning struck the, the, struck the tree in the kid's backyard and it fell over. And they found like the geodes in there. And it was basically a gateway to hell. Really good movie, really good gateway film. Highly recommend that you watch this one with your kids. You know, probably, again, at least 13 and up. Now, when I saw this film, I was, let's see, it came out in 87. I was born in 78, so I was nine. And it, Yeah, it was scary when I was a nine-year-old just because, like, like I said, the power went out in the theater, and that scared the crap out of me. But it wasn't like a film that gave me nightmares or anything. The Monster Squad, which is on Hulu right now, a really good one. Uh, and this is all about universal the universal monsters coming to life. And this group of kids has to save their neighborhood um, from the monsters. Really good film. Uh, Coraline, another animated film. I haven't seen this one. It's on my list. The Burbs, which is if you have uh, the Stars uh, streaming service, you can get that through Amazon or just through the Stars app. Uh, the Burbs is one of like my top three favorite films of all time. Uh, I think it's like number two, right below the Goonies. Uh, the Burbs is absolutely great. It's a P. I think that one rated, is rated PG. Yeah, that one's rated PG. Um, so nine and older, even maybe even younger. It's a funny film too. It's so it's it's like a it's a comedy with those horror elements added into it. Um, yeah, one of my favorite films. Krampus, which I actually did watch Krampus. It's available through HBO now. Uh, so if you pay for the HBO streaming service uh, through Amazon or the HBO app, it's on there. We watched it a few weeks ago. I finally got around to watching it. I thought it was great. Uh, my wife thought it was really good. And that film is only PG-13. I thought it was an R-rated film, but it wasn't. It's PG-13, I think because there's a little bit of language in there. Uh, not much, but there's some pretty scary moments in the film. I, I guess if you're probably a younger viewer, uh, and then also you're talking about the subject of Christmas and Santa Claus and this alter, this alternate Christmas deity that isn't bringing you presents, but is taking you away. So there is that whole thing, which is probably going to be scary for, really young viewers. So I would probably keep this 14 and up maybe, but yeah, this was a really good film. It's a really good gateway film. I think into the whole realm of horror because you're, you're taking this time of year that's supposed to be happy and turning it into something scary. This was a really good movie. Uh, it has a 6.2 on IMDb. I think that's kind of low. I enjoyed the film a lot. This was written and directed by Michael Doherty who did trick or treat which is one of my favorite horror films. So yeah, go check that out. You can, I mean, you can rent it on Amazon if you want to. The The standard definition version, version is only $2.99. But if you subscribe to HBO now, it is there for you uh, to watch. And then finally, a couple of the films, uh, Gremlins, of course, which is available on Netflix. The Addams Family, which came out um, in the late 90s, I think. Uh, probably somewhere around there. That's always a good one. Uh, there's nothing scary about that at all. Uh, that's on Netflix. Beetlejuice, I think, is a good one. And I think Beetlejuice, like films like Beetlejuice and, and The Addams Family and Gremlins, or, well, maybe not Gremlins, but and ho like uh, another animated film, Hotel Transylvania, these films kind of show your kids that monsters don't always have to be scary. 
I think, you know, if you can get your, your kids to understand that, you know, monsters aren't always scary, that kind of eases them, makes the whole horror thing a little easier to, to process. Uh, now, with me, I've said it on the show before, when I watched horror films, I always just thought, you know, if it was real, the cameraman would be dead too, which is the, the closing for my show. Uh, that's the way I got over horror. And that's the way I kind of re- un- process my, my brain said, okay, this isn't real because of this. What I'm watching is, is completely fake. And then it wasn't really scary for me anymore. But, you know, everybody has their, their different ways of, of processing horror, uh, dealing with it and overcoming it. And I think films like Am- Am- uh, Adam's Family and Beetlejuice and Hotel Transylvania show show kids that monsters aren't always these scary things that people make them out to be. And by the way, Hotel Transylvania 1 and 2 are really good um, animated films. I highly recommend those. Uh, Even for adults, they're they're really, really good. So there you go. There's sort of my rundown of television and movies for a younger audience. And I think we got some really good examples in there. Uh, I think we got more more good examples other than just gremlins you know what i mean sure people will always say hey yeah gremlins for kids but there's a lot more great horror out there for younger audiences if you want to get your kids into horror and get that get them bitten with a horror bug like you have it because that's what we are we are horror fanatics that's why i do this show that's why you listen to this show and i think horror is something horror is is a unique community that we're all a part of all a part of and getting your kids involved early, I think, is a really cool thing, especially if you can get them into like some of the horror conventions. Those are really fun to go to. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed my list of of horror for, for younger for younger viewers. Uh, now, for new to stream, uh, because I don't have any news, I, I want to ke- kind of keep this episode because we're already running lo- kind of long here. Because there is so much other stuff that I talked about, I kind of skipped news this week. But new to stream, on Netflix, we have Darkness Rising, uh, which I put in my queue. Not really sure about it. Uh, We'll see. And that's really it for Netflix, just that one film that I saw. Um, But for Shudder, we have uh, the German film The Nightmare. And we also have Prom Night 1 and 2. I started watching Prom Night. I haven't finished it yet. And then we also have Wolf Creek, the series. Now, if you haven't seen the films, these are sort of, um, quote unquote, torture porn films from Australia. Uh, there were two of them. I saw the second one, but I haven't seen the first one yet. But the one that I saw was extremely well done. Uh, very frightening, good effects, good gore, good storytelling. Well, they did a series uh, based off of those films. Uh, and Mick, the bad guy from the films, is also in the show, which I think is a plus. A lot of times when you make, when when filmmakers um, or big studios do a series based off a film, they have completely new actors, and a lot of times it just doesn't translate well. But uh, Wolf Creek, I think, is is going to be a bit better. I'm going to start watching this one this week, and I'll let you know how that goes. Uh, Also this week, I did watch The Babysitter, which was a fun watch. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it for you. I will do a review of it later on. Uh, And then I also watched Little Evil, which is on Netflix. Both of these are Netflix original films. Uh, And Little Evil was great. Man, it was fun. It's a horror comedy. Not overly gory. There's a little bit of gore. Not much. But man, it is a funny film. I really enjoyed it. I liked that one a lot. Uh, Babysitter, I liked less. And maybe when when I do a review, I'll discuss why. Um, But that's what I've been watching this week. And that's what you have new to stream. And that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode of Scream Stream. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for joining me every week. We are seven weeks in a row. And if you've followed me throughout my podcasting career, you know that (laughs) sometimes I slack and I go a couple weeks and I skip episodes, but we have, you know, we, we are seven weeks in, um, seven consecutive weeks. I really enjoy, enjoy doing this show. Um, this is kind of like my baby, 
But I do want to let you know or, or remind you that ScreamStream is listener supported and you can support the show at patreon.com slash ScreamStream. Again, you'll get uh, the original run a week early and seven days after I post it on Patreon for patrons, uh, it'll go public. And then you'll also get the behind the scenes podcast called uh, When the Screaming Stops. Uh, that is going to remain a patron exclusive. Uh, and then when you do become a patron, you'll get your own special uh, RSS URL that you can plug into any podcatcher app, whether it's Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, anything like that, Overcast. You can plug that URL in there and you will get your exclusive um, podcasts right there. And again, the easiest way to support the show is to share it with all your friends, share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, just share that link, screenpod.com slash podcast, uh, and let your friends know how much you love the show. And as always, you encourage me to keep this podcast going, and I greatly sp- appreciate all the support that you've given me so far. Uh, and if you have a movie you'd like me to review, or you want to suggest one, Send me your suggestion to ScreamStreamCast at gmail.com or go to ScreamPod.com slash contact. Remember to subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, TuneIn Radio, Overcast. Um, probably in December, hopefully I'll get into iHeartRadio as well and also Spotify there as, uh, too. And music for ScreamStream is, was created by Kevin McLeod over at Incompotech.com. And until next week, I'm James Gass saying, if it was real, the cameraman would be dead too. Good night. Good night.